I used to play live action role playing quite a lot. And some of those were one shot adventures that I played in the setting of Legend of the Five Rings. This one time we were having dinner in the LARP and in real life, Legend of the Five Rings being a Far East setting, we were all playing samurai of various descriptions, so eating with chopsticks. So one of the players took her chopsticks and stabbed them upright like this into her bowl. And the entire LARP just went completely silent because stabbing your chopsticks into your food like that meant that you, you were saying the food was poisoned. It is a dire insult to throw at the host of the party. And it initiated an entire series of actions that turned that LARP into one of my most memorable role-playing experiences. It was only possible, though, because we all knew as players that that was what those chopsticks standing upright in the food signified. We knew the magnitude of the insult that that player had just delivered to the host of the party. And the host of the party was, of course, forced to respond. And that is what I'd like to talk about today. Noble courts, how to build them, how to build the etiquette around them, authors who've done it well or role-playing systems that have done it well, and how to use that to drive your plot forward. My name is Marie Mullaney, and this is Just In Time Worlds. If you like this kind of content, please do subscribe down below. And if you want to get involved in the conversation and connect with me, discuss my world and further discuss world building and fantasy authors who do it well, I do have a Discord server, the link to that down below as well, where I am active and you can talk to other world builders. Okay, let's get cracking. I realize this seems like an obvious thing to say when discussing a noble court, but you really do need ranks of nobility. The first and most important thing before you start designing your court is you do need to settle on some kind of ranking system. It doesn't really matter what you call those noble ranks. You can use the English titles, you can use French titles, you can use Far East titles. But remember that whatever titles you use is going to flavor what your court feels like for your readers. So if you use French titles, then your court should be flavored roughly Frenchy. If you use German or Scandinavian titles, then you should probably flavor it like the Holy Roman Empire. If you use Far Eastern style of titles, then you must flavor it with Far Eastern etiquette and so on, because otherwise your readers are going to be extremely disconcerted by the name versus what they see of the court. So just think about that in terms of the titles that you use. The other big thing about nobility, not all noble titles have to be land-owning titles. Land-owning titles or titles that come with resource control is generally inherited generation to generation and is generally more valuable than the other kind of title. The other kind of title is one given to somebody in reward for their services and generally does not carry with it any kind of land and can't be inherited. But it does give them a lot of honor and status because it is an earned title. So it is a good idea to make some titles that are purely land owning and some titles that are purely given in reward for services because that allows you to have some conflict and tension between those two groups within your court and also to give people a reward without necessarily having to somehow create more land to give them. So just think about that when you're designing your system of nobility. The most important part about establishing your system of nobility is establishing your ranks, your ladder. 
You want to have somebody at the bottom, probably like a knight equivalent or chevaliers or samurai or some baseline nobility. Then a step up from that and a step up from that and a step up from that. And finally, your king or duke or whatever your grand high poobah is. You probably want about seven-ish steps between the lowest and the highest. Otherwise, you just don't have enough scope for play. The other thing you need before you start establishing etiquette is how does the court itself work? What positions are there? And for that, I'm going to turn to Legend of the Five Rings, the role-playing game, which did this so well in their establishment of a court. The first critical position that literally all courts have to have is some kind of money position. In Rokugan, this was filled by the very aptly named Imperial Treasurer. Another good title for this is Lord of the Purse or Lord of the Chancery. It doesn't matter what you call it, you have to acknowledge its power and you're going to need it in your court. Someone has to collect taxes and control expenditure, otherwise your Grand High Poobah will not have an army the next time he needs one. So make sure to create some kind of money position in your court. A court is primarily a place of politics and influence. As such, you need courtiers and lawmakers and diplomats who can meet with foreign ambassadors and so forth. Your emperor or king will need a chief political aide whose job it is to wrangle those people. In Rokugan, this role was filled by the left hand of the emperor. The ultimate political act is war, and as such, your army leadership needs to be present at court you're quite likely to need a position as some kind of head of the army, someone who will be in charge when the diplomats fail and the troops march. In Rokugan, this role was filled by the right hand of the emperor. However, there are threats that an army cannot match, threats that need to be eliminated in secret, or the secrets of others that need to be ferreted out. In short, your court will need some kind of spy master to deal with a hidden threat. In Rokugan, this role was filled by the underhand of the emperor. A court serves as the government in a kingdom, and governments need to enforce the law. In Rokugan, this need was fulfilled by the Emerald Champion, which was a really fun position because it was determined by the winner of the Emerald Championship contest. Contestants competed not just in physical contests, but also with regards to their knowledge of the law. This was therefore one of the few merit-based positions in the Rokugan court. The Emerald Champion, besides being the leader of the Emerald Magistrates, the law keepers of the empire, was also the emperor's chief bodyguard and as such fulfilled another role in court, keeping the Grand High Puba safe. And that's a pretty important job. In fantasy, you might want to include someone to look after magic. In Rokugan, this role is fulfilled by the Jade Champion, who, like the Emerald Champion, has to win a contest to get the job. The Jade Champion is in charge of what magic is and isn't legal, and is charged with preventing the rise of Maho, or blood magic, in the Empire. The Jade Champion also fills the role that all courts need, that of spiritual and knowledge-based advisor. And those are the roles that you need for a court. Let's test what I've been speaking about here against another well-documented court in fantasy, the Small Council of Westeros, as defined by George R. R. Martin. Chief Courtier and Military Command, Hand of the King. Spiritual and Knowledge-Based Advisor. Grand Maester, Treasurer, Master of Coin, Keeping the Law, Master of Laws, Military, Master of Ships, Shadow Arts, Master of Whispers, and finally King's Bodyguard, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. And there you have it. Those are the positions you have to have to make a court work. The other thing to think about in terms of your court is representation from your big regions. Like if you have dukedoms, do they send representation to the court to represent their interest there? 
What about ambassadors? Do you have neighboring countries that have sent embassies? And what are the status of those ambassadors? So those elements can really add some richness of different perspectives to your noble court as opposed to the same same of your in-country courtiers. Good things to think about when you're designing a noble court is what activities are there that courtiers participate in? Do they go hunting? Do they watch plays? Do they play board games of some description? Uh, check out my board games video over there. So it's important to think about what the courtiers are actually doing during the course of their day. And then, very important, what do people wear? Is there some visible indication of their rank? Do they have crowns, jewelry? In my world, what I did was I created a noble sash. Uh, you can check out the short over there and link in the description to the full details of the sash. And the sash indicates nobility, not just that it, you wear it, but also your rank, your house affiliations, even your magical prowess is indicated by the sash. Okay, so those are the nuts and bolts of how to put together a noble court. Let's crack on to etiquette. Etiquette of a court is designed to do a couple of things. The first one that I want to talk is about showing respect. Greetings and taking farewell is the most obvious place where you see this, the show of respect. If you think back to the first episode of the first season of Game of Thrones, when the king arrives in Winterfell and everybody kneels to him and stays down until he indicates by using his hand that they may rise. That is a very deep show of respect from the lesser nobles to the greater noble. You need to work that kind of greeting into your noble court. There needs to be some rules around how people greet each other upwards, downwards, and neutral on that ladder of nobility. Remember, this system of hereditary nobility exists because everybody respects it. And that respect is embodied by the greetings they offer each other. Build in your bows of greeting and of farewell and how people are acknowledged to know that, yes, they have been seen and the greater noble has now given them permission to speak. There are also many traditions that hold if the highest ranking person is standing, everyone has to stand. Some traditions hold that unless you are of near equal rank, you may not sit in the presence of royalty at all, even if they are seated. All of these rules are etiquette-based rules to show respect for the hereditary position. This is not necessarily respect for the man, but it is respect for the position and it has to be enforced in a court-based situation. Respect is also shown in the elaborate rituals of arriving and leaving at a gathering. As an example, do higher ranking people enter a gathering first so they can get the best seats or last so that everyone waits on them? Are people announced on entry into any gathering or do you use heralds just on special occasions or do you have no heralds at all? Do you need attendants like ladies-in-waiting or pages? If you do and you don't have those attendants for whatever reason, do you lose status? If you are at a formal gathering, how long should you stay there? Until the host leaves? Until the highest-ranking person leaves? Until the guest of honor at the gathering leaves? If you leave before the host, do you give insult to the host? Speaking of insult. Let's talk about etiquette and giving insult. One of the most interesting examples of insult actually comes from Shakespeare. In Henry V, the Dauphin of France sends the King of England a gift of tennis balls as an implication that the king used to be a wastrel. He used to just entertain himself rather than focusing on uh, learning how to be a good king. 
Henry I duly takes insult and uses that insult to motivate himself to go to war with France, which he eventually conquered due to the Battle of Agincourt. So you can insult someone by apparently sending them a gift, but only if you understand the context in which that gift is an insult. Now, you also need to think about how insults are resolved. In Henry V's case, he straight out went to war to resolve his insult. Maybe you don't want to go quite that far. Maybe you'd like to have a duel. Or maybe there's some way that people can resolve insult by means of some kind of game. However, dueling is a very traditional means of resolving insults, so let's spend a little bit of time on that one. From Ayajitsu of the Samurai to the Code Duello of the French, to pistols at dawn, to the home gang of Scandinavia, to the Ula duels of the Mursi in Ethiopia, our world is rich in the tradition of settling insults with violence. Of course, a duel doesn't have to be violent. I once had a flower arrangement duel in a Legend of the Five Rings tabletop game. The crane courtier beat the crap out of the crab who had the idiocy to challenge him. But if a duel is based on violence, it also doesn't have to be to the death. The home gang from Scandinavia ended at first blood. Of course, that first blood was quite often heart's blood and the contestant did die, but the thought counts for something, right? However, duels are very ritualistic violence and should be treated as such. You should put a fair bit of effort into world-building What happens in a duel? I have recently designed my own duels for the Empire of Lumiaron called Sash Duels. So I'll take you through my world-building process in the creation of these duels. The first question I asked was, who is allowed to challenge who? I decided that you can only challenge down the noble ladder, not up. So a lesser noble can't challenge a greater noble, no matter how large the insult. The lesser noble has to just suck it up, cupcake. The second question I asked is how is the challenge issued? In Western tradition, you slap your opponent across the face with your glove. But I had already invented my sash and it had tassels. So I came up with a ritual where you unhook your tassels and hold them out to show that you are willing to risk your honor. And then you speak the ritual words, which are, You are not worthy of your sash and I will strip you of it. I did want to put some kind of limit on nobles killing each other because otherwise you end up with a depopulated court really fast. So you have to have the permission of your liege to issue the challenge and to accept the challenge. However, if your lord refuses to allow you to accept the challenge, the matter under dispute is considered unresolved And your lord owes the challenger a boon as compensation for denying them satisfaction. The liege would be required to wear a tassel in the color of the challenger until the boon is delivered. These boons are called tassel boons and may be traded between nobles. The duel itself I made an immediate one and I made deadly. No holds barred, weapons and magic, the whole nine yards. And finally... How is the duel resolved? So what I decided is that after the duel is resolved, the winner cuts the loser's sash off them and returns it to the loser's lord, who then gives the winner the tassels of the loser. And hence, duelists who challenge people often and win are called tassel collectors. And that is how I came up with my rather deadly dueling system. If you think my world sounds interesting, there is a link down below to sign up as an ARC Advanced Reader Copy reviewer of my book. Please do consider signing up for that. There will also be a lucky draw and three people who are ARC reviewers will receive a signed physical copy of my book. I pinky swear promise I will not abuse your email address or sell it to anybody else. Let's crack on to probably the biggest reason for etiquette flexing. What you have to remember about a noble court is these people are inherited positions. They have to continually 
prove that they are amazing and they are justified in holding these inherited positions. So a lot of courtly ritual is based around flexing and giving courtiers the opportunity to flex, both in terms of money and in terms of their prowess with a sword or games or other things that are important to their culture. The best example of a monetary flex comes from our own world. When King Henry VIII met with King Francis I of France, they met on what is now called the Field of Gold. And the reason why it's now called that is because they used so much cloth of gold that the whole field glimmered with it. They used it for, the, for their clothing. They used it for their courtiers' clothing. They used it for their tents. Cloth of gold is a fabric created by putting threads of gold onto a backing of silk. Can you imagine the expense we're talking about here? That is a humongous flex. In fantasy, you also have the option of magicians flexing. What if your mage, every time he walks into court, is surrounded by his own little personal cloud that showers rose petals wherever he walks? That's a pretty impressive flex. What if you have magical contests where people compete with each other to show off their control or their power? That's a pretty big flex too. How do you get started doing all this? The way that I like to do it is I think about the journey that my courtier takes in a given day. How are they introduced at court? Is there a herald that announces their titles? Are there criers that run before them or do they just walk into some place and everybody knows who they are based on how they're dressed or it's purely by introduction? So give some thought to where they start their day at court. How do they greet a friend of a lower rank? How do they greet an enemy of a lower rank? How do they greet somebody who is of equal rank to them? How do they greet a superior who is also an enemy? And how do they greet a superior who is a friend? How do they give insult to somebody? And how do they respond if insult is given to them? Also remember to distinguish between grave insult and cutting words. Not everything can result in a duel to the death because then you're pretty soon going to have a depopulated court. What gives them the right to flex and how do they use it in any given day? And finally, how do they take their leave of court? When are they allowed to go? And is there any kind of announcement that they go through when they leave court? And that was my take on building a noble court. Remember that I'm looking for ARC readers. If you are interested, please do consider signing up. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up. And if you want to join the conversation and discuss courtly matters more, link to my Discord channel in the description. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time World.